thanks of course to the organizers for putting up this uh, putting together this very nice conference i'm having very nice uh, conversation and uh, you know attending interesting talks and thanks for giving me the opportunity to present this work which is in joint collaboration with uh, matt liefer david schmidt and rob speckens you can find more about it in the archive and it's about disputing you know the common claims that interference phenomena somehow capture the basic peculiarities the essence of quantum theory here is the outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to start with a motivation, then I'm going to describe the basic phenomenology of quantum interference in the setup of max Ender interferometers. In particular, I'm going to characterize what is the phenomenology that is traditionally regarded as problematic, meaning those aspects of the phenomenology that usually people associate uh, with claims that say that uh, quantum interference is inherently mysterious and truly non-classical. Then I'm going to describe the toy field theory, which is a classical statistical theory that reproduces this phenomenology while explicitly rejecting all these claims. And the end, I'm going to spend a couple of times or a couple of words on uh, what more nuanced aspects of interference really uh, capture a departure from the classical worldview. Okay, the motivation. Uh, you know, the motivation behind this kind of works is really to understand which features of quantum theory are uh, inherently non-classical. And in particular here, we focus on quantum interference because usually it is considered as uh, one of those. In particular, I wanted to start with this very famous quote from Feynman in introducing the double slit experiment in, uh, uh, in quantum theory uh, in its famous uh, lectures of physics, where he says that uh, it is a phenomenon which is impossible, absolutely impossible to explain in any classical way. It contains the only mystery. In telling you how it works, we will have told you about the basic peculiarities of all quantum mechanics. So if you want, you can see our work as having the goal to dispute these kind of claims. The claims that the basic phenomenology of quantum interference resists explanation in terms of a classical worldview. But you know, the first question to really address is what is considered to be mysterious about quantum interference? So I'm going to address this by focusing on the uh, simple setup of max ender interferometers. Uh, let me describe them. I'm going to consider two different configurations. The first one where we have a phase shifter in place and then a second one where we have a which way detector. So let me describe it. So we have basically a photon that impinges a 50-50 beam splitter. Then two paths originate left and right. We place a phase shifter on the right path and we assume that it can only do shifts of zero or pi. Then we have two mirrors, nothing really happens. Then these two recombine in a second 50-50 beam splitter. And then we have the left and right port that detects the photon, okay? Let me stress that we consider this scenario where 50-50 beam splitter, zero pi phase shifter, because it's the simplest possible scenario when we will see that we can reproduce the uh, basic phenomenology of interference. We don't need to consider more complex ones. The other configuration is where, as I said, we put a which way detector. So here is a detector that just detects if uh, the photon passes in that arc. Okay? So let me describe these two scenarios as usual in, the, in quantum theory. In particular, I'm going to use what is called the second quantized description. So we assume that we associate a mode with each arm. We're going to have the left and right mode. Each one is associated with a two dimensional Hilbert space. And we're going to use the uh, Fock uh, phase description. So basically, the Initial state is the state one zero that says that the left mode is occupied and the right mode is not. Associated to the beam splitter, we have a unitary. What it does, it just entangles the two modes, uh, bringing us to these uh, uh, entangled states of uh, uncorrelated modes, anticorrelated modes. We consider first the case where the phase shift does nothing, so nothing happens here. Before the 50-50 beam splitter, we have again this uh, state. We apply the unitary, and what we obtain is the state one zero, which just says that every time we perform this experiment, the left port is going to fire all the times. Okay? Let us see what happens when we put a pi phase shift uh, at the beginning as usual. This time, basically what the pi phase shift does, it just applies a Pauli Z on the uh, right mode, so it just flips the phase. As a consequence, also the relative phase becomes plus, so it's becomes a correlated entangled state. We apply unitary, and this time, the final state is 0, 1. That just says that all the times you run this experiment, the right uh, port is going to fire. So you see, we have seen these two scenarios where we have a maximum of probability in one port and a minimum of the other. 
and we can toggle between the two scenarios by changing the phase, uh, the phase shifter. And these two scenarios are scenarios that uh, describe an, an interference pattern, right? This is like in the two slit experiment, when you run the experiment and you see an interference pattern on the screen, you have a maximum and a minimum interference here, basically. And so we, we say that these are associated with wave-like behavior because, you know, like in the two slit experiment, if you put a water wave, that's what you will do. Let us see the other configuration when you put, um, when you place a which way detector in place, beginning same story. Now we assume that we uh, post-select on the case where the detector does not uh, detect the photon there. So according to the measurement uh, take rule, uh, we're going to end up in the state uh, one zero. So the left mode is occupied and the right mode is not. We apply the unitary associated to the 50-50 beam splitter and we obtain the final state, which is this one. This means that all the times, so uh, we perform the, we run the experiment many times and half of the time we're going to see the left port firing and half of the time the right port firing. So you see this time we don't have a maximum and minimum of interference, it's a uniform distribution and this is associated to a particle-like behavior, okay? So uh, I want to argue that with these two scenarios that we just described in quantum theory, we can reproduce the phenomenology that is traditionally regarded as problematic about quantum interference or uh, trap phenomenology. And the reason why um, we, we call it this way is because it's usually associated with claims that say that quantum interference is, uh, you know, inherently mysterious and non-classical. And in particular, let us see what are these claims that usually um, are made. The first one I already mentioned it somehow is this wave particle complementarity. So it seems that the quantum system sometimes behaves as a wave, sometimes as a particle without a possibility of a unifying description of them. And this re really seems something to defy any classical explanation, because in classical physics, wave and particles are very different things, right? So here I said it seems like this like dualistic kind of entity. Then the observer depends on some reality. It seems that if the photon is a wave or is a particle, uh, it's the observer that decides it in terms of what she or he decides to measure. Finally, a bit more, uh, uh, maybe subtle, uh, it seems that it's impossible to provide a causal explanation uh, in terms of local causes of what's going on. Think in particular of the case where you have the photon in the left arm before the second uh, beam splitter, then it seems like that the photon must know whether there is a which way detector or not on the other arm. Because if there is not, it's always going to output on the left port. But if there is, sometimes it's going to output on the right. So it seems like that there must be some non-local causal influence from the right arm to the left arm. Some people that didn't like this explanation provided even more radical explanations, like retrocausality from the uh, pores to the photon and many others. But let's, let us put all of them here in this category. It seems impossible to explain what's going on in terms of local causes, okay? So, so far I just described the, the trap phenomenology of interference, traditionally regarded as problematic, and what are the interpretational claims usually associated with it, okay? Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna describe the toy field theory, which, are, which is a classical statistical theory. Uh, it's an alternative theory to quantum theory, okay? It's not a model of quantum theory that um, reproduces this phenomenology while explicitly rejecting these claims, okay? And let me say that I'm not gonna provide the formal treatment of all the toy field theory. I, I mean, I don't have time, you can find it in the, in the paper. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you what is like the theory construction schemes to define it, and then I'm gonna just tell you the rules we need to reproduce the phenomenology under examination, okay? So the theory construction scheme. Um, so the toy field theory is an example of what is called a classical statistical theory with epistemic restriction. What does it mean? So it means that uh, uh, we define it uh, following like three steps, three ingredients. The first one, we need to define what is the underlying classical physical theory. So we need to specify what are the systems and the properties. This is the kinematics and also what is the, di the dynamics that this obeys. In particular, in this case, the systems are two field modes, the left and the right mode. And the properties are that each mode at every time has a well-defined occupation number and phase. Okay, so we have two modes with these two properties each. These properties are binary, so they can take value zero or one. And we also know that the sum of the occupation numbers is one, meaning that at every time only one of the two modes is occupied. The dynamics, we're gonna see it in action in a bit, but is uh, deterministic and local. Then we're gonna consider the statistical theory associated with this classical physical theory. So, you know, you can imagine that you have some uncertainty about what are the properties of the system. 
And so you describe it with uh, some probability distributions that they also follow some dynamics. This, if you want, is like when you build Liouville mechanics from uh, classical Hamiltonian mechanics. There is nothing like non-classical or strange about this. The extra ingredient we put here is that we have a restriction on what are the possible allowed probability distributions in this uh, uh, statistical theory, okay? And this is called an epistemic restriction because if you interpret the probabilities as states of knowledge, this poses a restriction on what you can know about the underlying uh, properties of the system, okay? In particular, in this soil field theory, the epistemic restriction re reads as that for a single mode, at maximum, you can know only one of the two properties. So if you know the occupation number, you are completely ignorant about the phase and vice versa, or you could also know the sum of occupation number and phase, for example, but being completely ignorant about the rest. And this extends also to two modes and so on, but uh, I don't need to go into all these details for now. Okay, so the toy field theory is a classical statistical theory over two field modes with an epistemic restriction, okay? Good, so now what I want to do is I wanted to reproduce this uh, trap phenomenology, right? The way I wanted to do it, I'm gonna put on the left side how quantum theory uh, reproduces it or describes it, and on the right, uh, how the toy field theory does it. But again, don't be confused. With this, I don't mean that the toy field theory is a model of quantum theory, it's just an alternative theory, okay? It would, you can imagine it exists even if quantum theory does, okay? So, um, in quantum theory, we used to describe the initial state as a state one zero, right? In the, uh, Fox uh, basis. In the toy field theory, the initial state is the state where we know that the left mode is occupied, the right mode is not, and so by the epistemic restriction, we are completely ignorant about the phases. Okay? The big splitter that in quantum theory was described by a particular unitary, here is described by what is called the swap rule. It says that every time you know you experience like the beam splitter, what happens is that the values of the occupation number of left mode becomes the value of the relative phase and vice versa, while all the other uh, variables remain constant, okay? So we call it a swap proof because you just exchange these values. But let us see this in action. So you remember, this was the first step of the max and interferometer. So the initial state is the state where we know the left mode is occupied, the right is not, and completely ignorant about the rest. We apply this swap proof. So basically the value of NL becomes the value of the relative phase. So here there is a plus because in arithmetic modulo two, you know, plus and minus is the same. And of course we also know that the, uh, one of the two modes is occupied. So NL plus NR is equal one, okay? So now just to soften the notation because I don't want to write these things all the times, I'm going to call this state of knowledge as a state of knowledge where I know NL is equal one. And this state of knowledge is the state of knowledge where I know that the relative phase is one, okay? So the modes are anti-correlated, okay? Just a notation. Good, now let us reproduce the first um, uh, configuration of the max and the interferometer. You remember this was the quantum mechanical description. In the Teufel theory, we start with the state where we know that the left mode is occupied. We apply the swap rule in correspondence of the first 50-50 beam splitter. We end up knowing that the state is a state where we are uh, completely ignorant about the individual value of uh, phases and, uh, and occupation numbers, but we know that the relative phase is one. In this case, where we put no phase shift, nothing happens. We arrive at the second beam splitter, swap rule. We obtain the final state where we know that the occupation number of left mode is one. That just says that every time we run this experiment, the left part is gonna fire. So we reproduce this case. Let us see the case where uh, there is a, a phase shifter. So same story at the beginning. When we put a phase shift on the right mode in the toy field theory, we represent it by saying that there is a flip in the value of the local phase of mod R, okay? But as a consequence of this, also the uh, relative phase is gonna change value just because we change value of the local phase. So we go from uh, anti-correlated modes to correlated modes. We apply this swap rule and this time we obtain the state where NL is equal zero. So we know that all the times we run this experiment, the right port is gonna fire. So you see, we reproduce, we reproduce both cases associated to this wave-like behavior. Now let us see the other configuration where we uh, place a witch ray detector. In order to see how the toy field theory reproduces it, let me define uh, what is the measurement update rule in the toy field theory. The measure, let, let us read it together. After a uh, measurement of the occupation number of a mode, one assigns zero probability to physical states that are inconsistent with the outcome of the measurement. Furthermore, the discrete phase of the mode is randomized. With probability a half is left unchanged, with probability a half is split. 
So this might sound a bit abstract. Uh, all that it says is that there is a learning step in the measurement of the true, where we get the knowledge of what is the value of the occupation number. But because we need to satisfy the epistemic restriction, there is also a disturbance step where we need to randomize the phase. Otherwise, we would know too much, right? And you can interpret this randomiz randomization as saying that half of the times the local phase gets uh, flipped, and half of the times it remains unchanged. Okay? Let us see this in action. Uh, you remember this was how quantum theory described it. Uh, now we start as usual. And this time, we imagine that we have this uh, which way detector that measures the occupation number of mod R. And imagine that we post select on the case where the uh, outcome is zero. Well, according to the measurement rule I just said, so we learn that the occupation number of mod R is zero. So it means the occupation number of mod le or left mod is one, but we are completely ignorant about the phase. Okay, this is the disturbance set. So we end up in this uh, state of knowledge. We apply again the swap rule, and what we get this time is that we know the relative phase after the second 50-50 beam splitter, but we are completely ignorant about the occupation number. And as a consequence, if you run this experiment, many times, half of the times, you're going to have the left port firing, and half of the time, you're going to have the right port firing. So we also reproduce this uh, case of particle-like behavior. So we saw that the toy field theory can reproduce both configurations. And let me summarize it very quickly how it does it. So if you realize every time which port is going to fire depends on what is the value of the relative phase before the 50-50 beam splitter, the second one. And in the case of wave-like behavior, this value is always fixed because it just came from the swap rule uh, with respect to the first initial state. In the case of uh, particle-like behavior, where we place a which-way detector, this causes a randomization of the local phase which implies a randomization also of the relative phase before the 50-50 beam splitter. And as a consequence, we have a round, random output for the uh, parts. Okay? And what is interesting is not only like it reproduces this uh, trap phenomenology, but it explicitly rejects all the interpretational claims. Let us see them one by one. Wave particle complementarity. So you remember we had this problem that the quantum system seems to be like this dualistic kind of entity, sometimes a wave, sometimes a particle. Yeah, there is only one entity. There are the two field modes that have well-defined properties at all times. What changes in the configurations is what we know about these properties, not about the properties themselves. Okay? Likewise, uh, observer dependence on reality. When the observer performs some measurements, it doesn't uh, you know, determine what is the entity, like uh, a wave or a particle. But, uh, what changes what uh, she or he knows about these properties, because these are well-defined at all times. Finally, the failure of explanation in terms of local causes. All the dynamics here is, is explicitly local. In particular, you remember the, the possibly problematic case was where we put a which-way detector in one arm. But what happens here is that this which-way detector just uh, uh, randomizes the phase, so half of the times uh, flips the local phase after the times it leaves it unchanged. This information uh, then changes what is the relative phase between the modes and determines what are the outputs. And you know what was thought to be no local causal influence here is just a mere update of knowledge, mere inference. Okay. And notice how important here is that what was the quantum vacuum states in quantum theory. Here is a state of knowledge as any other that can carry information. In particular, it can carry the information of the uh, local phase. Good. So in, uh, to summarize, the toy field theory reproduces the trap phenomenology of quantum interference while rejecting the interpretational claims that are usually associated with it. We can run a similar analysis uh, also for the um, other related phenomena like Elliott Subbyte Van Bomb Tester, Wheeler Delay Choice Experiments and the Quantum Eraser. You can find more about it in the paper. And let me conclude by saying that, uh, in conclusion, the trap phenomenology of quantum interference does not capture the essence of quantum theory. The mere phenomenology that we witness of basic quantum interference does not force us to accept the interpretational claims that are usually made. And here we provide a model that explicitly rejects them. And I think there is a lesson attached to this result that when you do research on quantum foundations and on what are the non-classicalities of quantum theory, it's not enough to just identify a phenomenon that seems, uh, I don't know, weird and uh, intrinsically non-classical, and I cannot find an a classical explanation of it, even if uh, you know, I'm super smart or whatever. 
But all these kind of claims about non-classicality should be backed up by rigorous Nogo theorems, where you formalize a compelling notion of classicality and you prove a contradiction with the statistics of the phenomenology under examination. And successful, uh, you know, like uh, works that did that were like Bell's theorem, Koch and Specker theorem. And uh, let me conclude by saying that there is still this kind of research to do in the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the topic of quantum interference, okay? And uh, in particular, because there might be some more nuanced aspects of quantum interference beyond this trap phenomenology that really resist an explanation in terms of the classical worldview. And with this, I just want to advertise a follow-up work where we show that uh, some of these aspects indeed constitute a proof of contextuality. So with this, uh, I thank you for your attention, and so stay tuned, and thanks. Thank you. Uh, I already see some questions. Thank you for the nice talk. So uh, one, one may argue that the trap phenomenology uh, actually is present in your explanation as well, because there's this observer dependence of the state. So there is disturbance, right? And you showed explicitly that the measurement process has a disturbance associated with it. So maybe uh, the mystery that you dispelled is actually still present in that particular feature. Yeah, so thanks for the question. Um, here, the disturbance is motivated by this epistemic restriction. So, you know, once you buy that, that it's, you know, a fine assumption to have in your theory, then it's not really related to, uh, you know, the observer, he or herself, that decides to, uh, you know, uh, change what's the <laughs> what the entity is. And, um, yeah, so just a consequence of the epistemic restriction. Once you buy it, then it must be there. It's a consequence. It's not like an a priori. So what I'm saying is that if you don't believe that the toy field theory is mysterious, then it's not mysterious. There, it, there is no observer depends on reality. Sure. The part is not mysterious. I'm just saying that, the, 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 saying that the, this epistemic restriction yes. itself is a surprising feature. It's where the weirdness seems to lie in, the, okay. in this model. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to discuss sure. about that uh, later. I have a very naive question. Uh, in which way does the Maxwell theory fail to explain a Mahzende interferometer? In which sense? The? Ma Maxwell theory, uh, usual electromagnetism, uh, does not explain a Mahzende interferometer. Uh, or is this not a classical theory? I mean, it's a... <laughs> yeah, it just, um, I don't know, like it, it wouldn't shed light on this, uh, how to reject this interpretation of claims, right? What, why? I don't know, I mean... Uh, I mean, I, I thought the whole point is that uh, we want to have a classical theory that describes the phenomenology. And, right, so, and I mean, uh, the Maxwell theory is classical as far as I understand, and it describes all of the phenomenology. Yeah, so for example, no? I'm not sure how you would square the fact that uh, when you have particle-like behavior in, in Maxwell theory, where you mentioned that you know, light is a wave, uh, how would you, uh, you know, be okay from an interpretational point of view about that? Oh, he, he, it seems you will still have this kind of uh, apparent mysteries. I, I wouldn't say this. So uh, I agree that um, if there is a problem, then it's in the particle-like behavior. Yeah. Um, but um, you, uh, in your setup, you need a detector, uh, which is this, uh, which way detector, right? And how would you realize this in an optical setup? You can realize this by measuring the intensity reproducing the beam by having, I don't know, some gas cell through which you go with fluorescence going out. I don't know, something like this. Design coherent processes and they will give you uh, the result which you uh, describe as particle-like. Right, so like, let me say that the problem is at an interpretational level. I would say that uh, with just uh, Maxwell electrodynamics, I'm not sure how you would interpret the case of particle-like behavior because you postulate that there are no particles somehow. And uh, yeah, I think that would be the main challenge. But I don't know. But it's yeah, maybe maybe yeah. we can provide a model and uh, yeah. With yeah, maybe we should also discuss later. <laughs> Let's solve yeah. this. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's, uh, it's a good idea. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for a nice talk. Um, I guess for me, one of the well, one of the things about wave-like behavior is that you have a continuous variety of phases. Right. Uh, so I'm wondering if there's a possibility to 
if you see there's a possibility to extend this toy theory to include other phase chain, other phase gates than just a zero and pi gate, and if it would still reproduce the uh, same observation. So now with this toy theory, and actually, you know, if you can exploit more phases, then you know that's where more nuanced aspect of the phenomenology come in, and then you can, for example, find proof of contextuality, as you were saying. So it's uh, that it was important to just consider the, I would say, the simplest scenario where to witness, you know, the the basic phenomenology of interference. Uh, again, exactly like if you go to more complex scenarios, that's where you should find for what you know sources of non-classicality. Oh, yeah, great question. Where is uh, <clears throat> Wigner's friend going to end up in this classification? Is it going to be in with Bell and Coach and Specker, or is it going to be explainable with some toy theory? I mean, uh, I mean. I mean, most of the treatment of bigger friends are associated with no-go theorems, right? And uh, so I think that's good methodology. Then the point is that uh, it's not just enough to have a no-go theorem to have like something uh, super interesting, you know, like the assumptions need to be compelling of classicality. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would say, yeah, it's a good example of uh, another no-go theorem. Uh, yeah, then we can discuss how how the assumptions are phrased. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting talk. I was wondering, um, when I think about quantum interference, for example, I, I tend to think also <clears throat> as a sort of a distinction between classical and quantum, sort of the quantum advantages in algorithms, let's say the Deutsche Jose algorithm, right. let's say, right, which uses right. the relative right. phase. Well, although we don't have sort of um, lower bounds, so we just know that there is a better algorithm than the classical, but we don't have a proof that there is not a better classical, right? So it's not really uh, a no-go uh, theorem in that sense. But uh, do you think that this would also be able to be applied there? Yeah, so um, of course, like if you can do anything in a max under interferometer, that's a universal quantum computer, right? You could do anything. Um, there are some algorithms that I suspect that you could do j even with very simple uh, things like that. And so, yeah, somehow are not really interesting from a, you know, like a quantum advantage point of view. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I never done it. I don't know, but I have the, have the feeling you could do that or at least try to see if that, that can be done. Well, hi, thanks for the interesting talk. Um, so a question is maybe uh, an obvious one, but how is this related to Speckens toy model? Is it essentially the same? Yeah, type yeah, it's model essentially the same. Just in the original toy theory, you don't um, assume that the the underlying systems are fields, are field modes. Okay, you imagine more there are parts. So it's more the interpretation of the systems is different. Correct. But the model it's the itself same. is the same. Yeah, it's the same. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, so I had a clarification question mostly. So when you are reproducing this like particle life, uh, particle like uh, parts, um, so from the quantum, like the, the quantum version, it's obvious why it should be with probability half in like the two, it comes from the amplitudes, right? But from your measurement update rule, I didn't get how you get that it's 50-50. Yeah. Because you say that we can know like one of them, but not the other one. Yeah, yeah no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain uh, all in details. So, uh, where is it? Yeah. Yeah, here. Yeah, so what happens? when you uh, apply the uh, which way detector, you get the, to know, yeah, you get the, the value of the occupation number is zero, and by the uh, measurement of the rule, half of the time the phase remains the same, okay? So imagine those half of the times, what happens is that you have the scenario, like the first scenario we had uh, in the, in the, in the wave-like case, right? Where basically all the times you go on the left, because when you have, uh, when the phase remains the same here, mm -hmm. then the relative phase would be uh, one. Yeah, and so after the swap, you really want. The, the other half of time of the case where you flip the phase, then this constitutes also a change in the relative phase that becomes from one to zero. And so those half of the times after the 50-50 beam splitter, you have the right port to fire. So that's how you... So, but if, you, if you imagine the randomization as half of the time you flip the face, half not, ah, okay. then you see that half of the time you have like a, what you had in the wave-like behavior for uh, 
zero phase shift and half of the time what you had for pi phase shift. Okay, thanks. Yes. Um, sorry, so a follow up. So did I understand correctly that what you're saying is that the measurement by the measurement rule is actually affecting the face, the real face that the particle has? Yes. Right. So then I, I thought you were saying that this two model, what we, the, one of the objectives was to reject this uh, incongruence of the observer affecting reality. Um, how does these two points? Yeah, so this match? is connected with Ernesto's uh, question uh, that um, here the disturbance is a consequence of the epistemic restriction. So if you imagine that is a rule that your theory has, like a law, okay, then that's a, it's a consequence of that. It's not a consequence of the observer choosing or like, a, a, yeah, like, I don't know, performing the, the measurement. Um, yeah, it's just a consequence of the epistemic restriction. So uh, you could not think of not having it, otherwise you would know too much and you, you would violate the, um, the epistemic restriction that defines the theory. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a consequence of how the theory is defined. Uh, but yeah, there is no like observer dependence or reality. All right, let's thanks Lorenzo again. Thanks. Today I will uh, talk about uh, compatibility of quantum instruments. Uh, this will be based on my paper with my friend uh, Matte Farkas. Uh, this has been published in uh, Physical Review. I'm from India uh, and my institute is uh, the Institute of Mathematical Sciences, Chennai. And I'm also affiliated with Hopomi Bhababa National Institute, Mumbai. At first, I want to thank organizers for uh, uh, I mean, giving me a ch chance to present in this work. Okay. Oh, sorry, in this conference. Okay. Uh, so let's start. So everyone knows that uh, quantum instruments are defined as the uh, set of top completely positive maps. And if you sum them, you will get a quantum channel there. That's a, a CPT map. And any measurement uh, can be implemented through a quantum uh, instrument I if this condition that uh, trace of uh, phi x rho is equal to trace of rho a x holds for all x uh, and x belongs to the outcome set of a and such instrument is called a a compatible instrument okay now uh, this this is the definition of com compatibility of quantum instrument which is uh, there in many literatures including the literatures which is uh, written at the footnote and this definition says that uh, two instruments, I1 and I2, are compatible if there ex exists a joint instrument, such, such that if you take marginal of the CP maps of that instrument, you will get the uh, CPP map maps of indi in individual in in instrument. As this is uh, already there in the literature, we will call, call it traditional com compatibility. And the whole work is to show that this definition has some drawbacks. This is not, this should not be the correct definition. And uh, then we actually uh, introduce uh, what I mean. What should be the uh, I mean new definition? And uh, we prove that uh, this definition has no drawback. So let us define uh, our definition. Means whatever I we proposed. Uh, yeah, but uh, before that, uh, let's. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, look into this uh, picture. This actually uh, representing the. Uh, traditional com compatibility. I mean, uh, here uh, downward arrows are the uh, quantum systems. So uh, instrument I is applied on the quantum system and you do classical post-processing of out out outcomes, you will get the uh, classical outcomes of uh, indi individual in instruments, but there is just one uh, quantum output here. So yeah, so th this is clear from the uh, definition. So this quantum output can be attributed to either first instrument or to, 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 to the second instrument, but cannot be uh, the outcome of both. Okay. So let's define the parallel com compatibility. So uh, we introduce this notion. So here, uh, two instruments, uh, I1 and I2, uh, will be called parallel comp compatible if there exists an instrument such that if you, you have to take partial press as well as you have to take mar marginal to uh, at marginal of the CP maps of that joint instrument. Uh, to get the uh, CV, CV, CVP maps of indi individual instruments. So um, this is our, our uh, new definition. And this definition can be understood from this figure, although this figure is, is just an example of that uh, definition. So here al also downward arrows repre represent the quantum system. So here uh, at first, uh, a joint channel, 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 lambda is 
acted on the quantum system. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, then you have two une unequal clones, lam lambda one row and lambda two row, and then you apply uh, quantum instruments J1 and J2. Then uh, this I1 will be lambda compose J1 and I2 will be lam la lambda compose J2, 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 J2. And if that this structure exists, then uh, I1 and I2 uh, is parallelly comp com compatible. It can be shown very easily. Okay. Now uh, we show that these two definitions are in inequivalent. This is proved in our previous part. So I will just uh, mention the propositions. I will not go to the uh, proof. So we have proved that uh, there exist pairs of quantum instruments which are parallel comp compatible but not traditionally comp compatible. Also, there exist pairs of quantum instruments which are traditionally comp compatible but not parallel comp compatible. So therefore, these two notions are com completely different. Um, they are not equi equivalent. Next, draw pairs of tra traditional com compatibility. Two quantum devices are said to be compatible if there exists a joint DVD device which produces outputs of both devices simultaneously when implemented on the input state. Now, note, note that a quantum in instrument has both classical as well as uh, quantum out uh, outputs. So therefore, if two instruments are compatible, then jo joint, uh, joint instruments should produce both cl classical and quantum out outputs of both instruments instruments but in case of parallel com compatible uh, sorry in case of traditional compatibility we have already seen that joint instrument pro produces the classical out outputs of both instruments but does not produce the quantum out outputs of both instruments this is the first drop drop back and the second drop drop back is that uh, we show in next two propositions that traditional compatibility can capture measurement com com compatibility but cannot capture channel com compatibility. So proposition two, three says that uh, two measurements are compatible if there exist, uh, uh, I mean, two quantum instruments, who, I mean, through which uh, those measurements can be performed. Per per and those measurements are, uh, sorry, those in in instruments are uh, traditionally comp compatible. So therefore, it can uh, capture the measurement com compatibility. But in proposition four, uh, I mean, uh, we, sh we have shown that there exist uh, compatible quantum uh, quantum channel signals, uh, phi A and phi, phi B, with uh, same out output Hilbert space, but there does not exist any uh, compatible uh, traditionally compatible quantum instruments, IA and IB, IB such that if you sum the CVP maps of IA, you will get phi A. And if you sum the CVP maps of I, IB, you will get phi, phi, phi B. So proposition four says that uh, traditional compatibility cannot capture the channel, channel, channel compatibility. So we have shown two drawbacks of uh, traditional com com compatibility. Now arguments for uh, parallel com compatibility. Parallel com com compatibility does not have any draw drawback like tra traditional com compatibility. First, first of all, in case of parallel compatibility, joint instrument produces both classical and quantum outputs for both the instruments. So, uh, unlike uh, traditional com com compatibility, uh, parallel compatibility does not have this draw drawback. Furthermore, we show in in the next theorem that parallel com compatibility can capture both measurement and channel com compatibility. Two measurements are compatible if and only if there exists an A compatible instrument and then B compatible instrument such, such that uh, A and B are parent parallel comp comp compatible. Uh, and uh, second team, I mean, uh, the second part of theorem one, it says that two channels phi one and phi two are compatible people if and only if there exist uh, uh, two, two instruments I1 and I2 uh, such that you have, if you uh, sum the CP map, uh, uh, of I1, you, you will get phi1, and if you sum the CVP map of I2, sorry, uh, yeah, I, I2, you will get phi2, and these two in instrument means I1 and I2 have to be par par parallel uh, comp compatible. And third theorem is if an A compatible instrument IA and a B, B compatible instrument IA are parallel compatible, then A and B both are compatible with both phi and phi A and phi, phi B means. A can be compatible with phi, phi B also, and B, B can be compatible with phi, phi A also. So this gives us the complete picture that uh, parallel compatibility can capture measurement comp compatibility as well as general comp compatibility. So that, therefore, it does not have the second drawback of, uh, of traditional comp compatibility. 
So uh, in this way, we overcome all the drawbacks of traditional shonal compatibility. So we propose that parallel compatibility, uh, the definition which we propose, uh, I mean, um, that should be uh, the proper definition of um, compatibility of quantum instruments. So that just some, some, some summary and future direction, we have in, introduced the notion of uh, parallel compatibility of quantum instruments. We have shown the uh, drawbacks of traditional compatibility and argued that it is conceptually incomplete. And then we have uh, uh, shown that uh, parallel compatibility does not have any drawbacks like traditional compatibility. Uh, therefore, we propose to adopt parallel compatibility as the definition of com compatibility of quantum instruments. In future, it will be interesting to uh, further characterize the uh, compatibility of quantum instruments. And we, we would like to, uh, I mean, uh, look at uh, quantitative measures of instrument compatibility and would like to link this uh, to the performance of some uh, quantum information processing tasks like um, sequential QRAC, means quantum random access code, uh, or uh, some kind of uh, state discrimination task. So thank you very much. Thank you. I uh, end my talk here. Hello. Did you look at the interaction between this notion of compatibility and some of the established frameworks for, say, contextuality uh, involving uh, alternative choices yeah. of measurement? No, uh, but till now we did not look into it. But uh, I mean, in future, we I mean that that will be uh, one of our goals. All right. Okay, let's thank the speaker again then.